Our church-wide theme for March is journey. And when our scheduled guest speaker, the Reverend Sue Redfern Campbell, had to cancel because of her husband's sudden death, that got me reflecting on the journeys through grief each of us must take many times in our lives. We hold Sue in our hearts, for we have all known devastating loss and sorrow, the deaths of loved ones, to be sure, but also the loss of health, home, youth, jobs, friends, so many losses, so many if-onlys, so many hoped-for futures gone. In my own sorrow, I've often turned to the writing of Mary Oliver. Here's the last half of her poem in Blackwater Woods. Every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this, the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things, to love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends upon it, and when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. The words about letting go are well known. They're even in the back of our gray hymnal. But when grieving the losses of our lives, we cannot usually move quickly to letting go. First, we have to spend time with Mary Oliver's haunting image, the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation. How do we get across the black river of loss? For that river is wide and the current strong. A crocodile may say he'll carry us over, but he's not to be trusted. And besides, our heart is hanging bloody and broken on a tree on this side of the river. There's no way around the river, no tunnel underneath it. The only bridge is one of those scary swinging rope bridges hanging by a few badly frayed strands with footboards that are either rotten or missing entirely. In the beginning, it does not seem possible to cross. For in truth, those we love are not replaceable. When they die, a piece of us dies too, and we're left with a hole in our hearts and a complex roller coaster of emotions. Sorrow, anger, despair, Relief, numbness. For me, Oliver's Black River of Loss is connected to another literary image, this one by Norman MacLean. Eventually, all things merge into one, and a river runs through it. The river that runs through it, the river that runs through all our lives, is the Black River of Loss for there is heartbreak at the heart of things. But, and here is the wonder, the black river of loss is the same stream as the bright river of life and love. And the salvation that Mary Oliver says lies across the river, that perhaps is learning to love our lives again. What helps us navigate the black river of loss? Poet May Sarton suffered from severe depression throughout most of her life, and she endured the deaths of lovers and dear friends. In her Journal of a Solitude, she wrote, this morning I woke at four and lay awake for an hour or so in a bad state. It is raining again. I got up finally and went about the daily chores waiting for the sense of doom to lift. And what did it was watering the house plants. Suddenly joy came back because I was fulfilling a simple need, a living one. Dusting never has this effect, and that may be why I'm such a poor housekeeper, but 
Feeding the cats when they are hungry or giving punch clean water makes me suddenly feel calm. Whatever peace I know rests in the natural world, in feeling myself part of it, even in a small way. Now, I do not claim, nor would May Sarton, that watering a plant or feeding the pets cures grief and makes the pain go away. Of course not. But it may help just a tiny bit. For though grief immobilizes us for a while, tending just one living thing may be doable. And in caring for that one other life, we may begin to care for our own as well. But how does that happen? Why should paying attention to such simple, ordinary things as pets and plants bring solace in times of sorrow? How is it? that they could help us see that the black river of loss is also the bright river of love. Most of the time, our attention is spread so thinly that we don't notice much of anything. And when we're grieving, we look mostly to the past because it feels that our future, or at least the future that we wanted and expected, has been taken away. But when something completely absorbs our attention in the present, even for a short time, that allows our natural powers of recuperation to act, it shifts our focus beyond our own isolation and helps us feel connected to something larger than ourselves. We are then invited to step back just a little, look around, and ask, what else is here? What? else is here. As soon as we can ask that question, we have taken the first step toward being able to love our lives again. If we ask, what else is here? The answer will be positive. It may not be the answer we hoped for, but it will be something that will save us, something that will bring us back to joy, to gratitude, to possibility, and to everyday miracles of endurance and grace. For as the choir's anthem reminds us, though much is taken, much abides. These moving words come from Alfred Lord Tennyson's Ulysses. In this poem, Ulysses, AKA Odysseus, is an old man. He has lost nearly everything. His loved ones, his strength, perhaps his sense of self. But he still has friends, and he still has time to set sail with them for one last adventure beyond the western stars. For Ulysses, much has been taken, but much abides. So it is for us, whatever our age or situation, much is taken. Our losses are great and our grief is deep. But even so, much abides. An aspen pushes up through a burn scar. The dew on the spider web catches the sunlight. A friend offers a cup of tea and a listening ear. We ask. What else is here? Be still, pay attention, and the answer will come. The world will show us its gifts, for much abides. As Barbara Kingsolver writes, in my own worst seasons, I have come back from the colorless world of despair by forcing myself to look hard at a single glorious thing a flame of red geranium outside my bedroom window, and then another, my daughter in a yellow dress, and another, the perfect outline of a dark sphere behind a crescent moon, until I learned to be in love with my life again. Rather than fighting our way across the fierce currents of the Black River of loss, what often happens is that one day we find we are on the other side of that river without quite knowing how we got there. Maybe we were stronger swimmers than we had imagined. Maybe friends threw us a line. 
Maybe we just stopped struggling and trusted the current to carry us, but somehow we are in love with our lives again. And standing on the other side of the river, the side that holds our salvation, we can feel the jagged edges of that hole in our hearts begin to soften a bit. The empty space is still there, and it always will be, but we can go forward putting one foot in front of the other, carrying our loved ones with us, sometimes in our DNA, always in our hearts. After my dad died, a friend helped me cross the Black River of loss by giving me a broccoli seedling to nurture, much as I nurtured my memories. I took it with some hesitation because I do not have a green thumb. What if the plant dies, I thought. What would be the symbolism in that? On the other hand, my dad had died. So I put the seedling on a sunny kitchen windowsill and watered it faithfully. It grew. Good job, Dad, I thought. I planted the seed seedling outdoors and did my best to shield it from the neighborhood cats who believed that my garden was a not so cleverly disguised litter box. The broccoli thrived and produced many meals for us over that summer. Whenever I cut a stalk or admired the curl of a leaf, I thought of my dad, sometimes with a heart tug, sometimes with a smile. But by fall, it became clear that it was time to say goodbye to the broccoli plant. But just as I hadn't been ready to part with my dad, I resisted pulling up the plant. One more day, I thought. And then I realized how often we all wish that for ourselves and those we love. So I pulled up the broccoli plant and I laid it down on top of the soil, planning to compost it later. When I went back after a week to do that, the uprooted dead broccoli plant was covered in tiny yellow flowers. One last gift from dad's broccoli. So it is for all of us. From death comes new life. From sorrow comes beauty, often when and where we least expect to see it. And having crossed that river, we are reminded that love does not belong to us. We belong to it. We rest in the grace of the world, and from somewhere deep inside us comes gratitude. We are able to say to those who have gone before us, thank you. Wherever you may now be in this vast and wonder-filled universe, thank you. Thank you for all you have given, for all you were, for all you still are. And here is something else to remember when standing by that river. The word alone comes from two old English words, all and one. Even when we are alone, we are all one. Knowing that we are companions on the journey, that we're all just traveling through, can help us turn sorrow into compassion. And if God is the love that binds us each to each, then God lives in our awareness that eventually all things merge into one, that the same stream of life flows through all being. It is a black river of loss, but one whose ripples are yet dappled with sunshine and love, whose murky waters also flow clear with memories and healing and hope. I close with a poem by Mariah Osborne. <clears throat> I have journeyed to a place of great sorrow, and there did I cry from the very depths of my soul. For days you thought I might never return, but I have come back to you. 
stronger, richer, with greater knowledge of myself. The crack in my heart will remain forever. Its purpose, no longer to let grief out, but to let greater love in. So may it be.